So this is section 7.3 where we're talking about sampling distributions. And this is actually a very important idea and one that underlies most of what we do for the rest of the class. So just a few things before we start learning about our new stuff is we have a difference between population parameters and sample statistics. So again, your population is everything you're interested in and then you take a smaller sample. So if you have something like the average or the mean of a population, we call that mu and if it's for the sample, we call it x bar. Okay. If you have standard deviation, we do sigma for the population, s for the sample. The variance would then be sigma squared or an s squared. The sample size is one we don't usually worry about too much. Sample size is n and a proportion is p for your population and p hat for your sample. And it does make a big difference just because what numbers I'm giving you make a big difference in what problem you're going to do, what test you're going to do. So it might seem silly to have two different sets of notation, but we will use it a lot, so you'll want to memorize those. So first we talk about all possible samples, because from any population, there would be many different samples of size n that you could choose. So like, let's let a population be the set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now this is a very small population, just so that it's actually manageable for us to do this. Let's find all the possible samples of size 2 that could be chosen. Notice it's without replacement. and we don't care about the order. Okay, usually for most things we do, if you're going to be going on sampling, you never want to sample the same person twice, that's a waste of time. And we don't usually care who was surveyed first or sampled first. So if we're looking at all the samples of size two, let's see, I could pick a zero and a one. Again, remember you're not actually repeating anything. Or I could pick a zero and a two. I could pick a zero and a three or a zero and four. Or I could pick, starting with one, a one and a two. I don't have to worry about one and zero because we don't care about changing the order. A one and a three, one and four. And then, let's see, two and three, two and four, and finally, three and four. So those are all of the possible samples we could have chosen. So there were 10 possible samples. Now, depending on which sample I pick, is that going to affect something like my sample average or my sample standard deviation or anything you want to think about? Depending on which sample I pick, I'm going to get different numbers and different sample statistics. So this is what we call a sampling distribution. So since there are many different samples that could be chosen, any sample statistic like your mean, your mode, your median, anything you can think of that you can compute, will be different based on which sample you choose. Okay, so that's very important. Whatever you choose, whatever you're calculating will be different based on which sample you choose. Now because of this, we call each statistic or each of these different things I could calculate is considered a random variable because this value can change from sample to sample. And because it's changing so much, we say that it has its own distribution called the sampling distribution. So it's the distribution of all of your possible samples. And this idea that your value of your statistic changes from sample to sample is called sampling variability. So variability meaning it can change. So let's see how it actually would change. On the next page, we can calculate, we can go through, I wrote down all the possible samples, and we can go through and calculate the mean, the range, and the maximum. And I did the standard deviation just because that takes too long to do by hand. So to find the mean or the average, you add them together and divide by two. So my first one would be 0 0.5, 1, 1.5. So I'm just going through and actually calculating the average here in my head. Zero plus four is four, divided by two is two. Let's see, 1.5, 2, 2.5. Sorry. So we're going to go through and just fill all of these out. I'll just write down what they were. We have another 2.5. 3 and 3.5. And okay. That's really just adding them together, so 0 plus 1 divided by 2. 0 plus 2 divided by 2, etc. So we're just doing that for all of them. So notice, based on which sample I chose, that I got a different sample mean. And because I got 10 different values, most of them are repeated, but there were 10 different sample means, 
depending that I could get depending on which sample I chose. So again, it's very important that I did that depending on which sample you choose, you're going to get a different sample mean. We could also do this for range. If you remember on range, range is just max. minus minimum. So on each one, and we're going to do 1 minus 0 is 1, 2 minus 0 is 2, 3 minus 0 is 3, 4. Let's see, we have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1. Okay. And we can look at the maximum, so just pick the bigger number. One, two, three, four, two, three, four, three, four, four. And again, the standard deviation I already calculated for you. But I want you to notice again, for each of these different statistics, the value changes based on which sample you happen to pick. So because there are 10 different values for the sample mean, depending on which sample you choose, it means it has its own distribution. And anytime we have a distribution, we can draw a graph for it. So what we're going to do, we'll zoom out a little bit. And you can see down here I left space so we can do the sampling distribution of the sample mean or draw a histogram for my values of the sample mean. So for the 0.5, come up here, let's see, how many times do you see a 0.5 for the mean? So we're only looking at the mean at the moment. How many times do you see 0.5? I see a 0.5 once. I see 1.1. One, one. I see two 1.5s, two twos, two 2.5s, two one three, and one 3.5. Okay. So what we just drew here is the distribution of all possible sample means. And I can do this for all of my other statistics we found. So like the sample range, I can go ahead and graph this for my sample range. So go ahead and take a minute and draw these next two in. And I'll do myself. So I just look up, I have a one, two, three, four ones. So my one will go up to the four. Etc. So go ahead and fill this in. Okay. So once you drew it in, it should look something like this. So for my ranges, we went from 4, 3, 2, and then 1. So this is our distribution of all the possible sample ranges. So our most likely sample range would probably be to get a 1, less likely to get a 2, 3, and then not very likely to get a 4 for your sample range. Okay. And then down here we do the maximum. So again, this would be the distribution of all your possible sample maximums. And this would be your distribution for all the possible sample standard deviations. So again, even though I've said this several times, you can't say enough, the idea that depending on which sample you pick, you're going to get a different value for your sample statistic. So let's do another example to help us understand the sampling distribution. So we have an automaker designed a new mid-sized model for sale to the public. And last year they made six cars. Now because we only have six cars, this is our actual population is six cars because they only made six cars. Now they randomly selected two of the six cars for testing, for preliminary testing to kind of see what their mileage might be. Let's see, so for these two cars, they happen to find a mileage of 30 and 32. So the mean, so the mean or average of this sample is going to be, let's see, 30 plus 32 divided by 2 is 31. So for this sample, we have a sample mean of 31. And they use this as their estimate for the mileage of their six cars. Now, of course, the sample of just two cars isn't very reliable. So after the car show, when they could damage the cars, they tested all six models. And here are all of the results. So this is the entire population because again, there were only six cars. 
So what we can do is we can go through and we can find the probability distribution and our histogram describing the population of the six individual car mileages. So our mileages were 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34. Now, because there were just six values, each one should be equally likely. All of the probabilities are going to be one-sixth. So for our individual cars, if we were to draw this, let's say that this tick right here is one-sixth. Each one is just going to have the line that comes up to one-sixth. So this is a very nice uniform distribution. They're all equally likely. And because we know all the values in the population, we can find our population mean. Mu. So mu, to find this mean, you add them all up and divide by how many there are. So 29 plus 30 is 31, plus 32, plus 33, plus 34, and there are six of them. So this gives me 31.5. So what is mu and how does it compare to the sample mean that we found above? So mu equals 31.5. So our population mean is pretty close to the sample mean of 31 that we found up above. And usually your sample means will be pretty close to your population means. 31, 31.5, it's not too bad. But now, if we went through and we found all of the possible samples of size 2 that could have been chosen. So here are all the possible samples here under the car mileages, 29 to 30, 29 to 31, et cetera. And we found the sample mean of each one. Let's go through and find the frequency or how often each one happened and the probability and graph that and see what the sample means look like. So for 29.5, it looks like we only have one of those. We have 130. And then we have two 30.5s, two 31s, three 31.5s, a two, a two, a one, and a one. And that gives us a total of 15. So for my probabilities, we'd have one out of 15, one out of 15, two out of 15, two out of 15, three out of 15, two out of 15, etc. And we can graph these. So over here you can see I have my sample mean mileage and probability. So I'll just do each tick as a 1 15th. So 1 out of 15, 2 out of 15, 3 out of 15. So you can go ahead and just draw these in. For 29.5, there is a 1 of them, 130, and then we have a 2, a 2, a three, a two, a two, a one, and a one. So this is our distribution of all the possible sample means. What do you think about this, looking at this shape? So we have learned how to describe shapes of graphs. So let's go ahead. I'll wait for you guys to actually give me some answers. How would you describe the shape of this graph? So again, looking at this, when we look at the possible sample means, they're unimodal, symmetrical, and they kind of start looking normal. And it turns out that that's not a coincidence. This is going to happen every time. When you take your sample means, they're always going to start looking like the normal distribution. 
which is really nice because we know things about the normal distribution and we know how to find probabilities for the normal distribution. And so you can even kind of think about this as almost like a population of sample means. We don't usually call it that, but it is all the possible sample means that I could get. And so once you have this population of all your possible sample means, we again call it the sampling distribution of the sample means. And when we say the sampling distribution of the sample means, we really mean it's the distribution of all the possible sample means. So let's talk about our next page. We usually don't know all the values of the population. So in our last examples we did and we can actually go through and list out all the possible samples, but usually we don't know everything in the population and all the possible samples would be way too big to find and work with. Okay, but there are some theoretical properties that we do know and we're going to look at an applet to discover these properties. Okay. So while we look at this, I want you to think of the questions of what does the sampling distribution of the sample mean look like? Does it matter what the original population looks like? And specifically, well, what would happen if we do have a really weird original population? And we'll also look at the mean for, okay, so notice this is some new notation here, this mu x, this is the mean of all the possible sample means, which is kind of interesting. So you have all your sample means and then you take the average of that. And this is the standard deviation of all the possible sample means. So we put the x bar there to tell you it's the standard deviation of all the possible sample means. So we're going to look at all of these things. And also, how does that standard deviation change based on our sample size n? So keep those in mind as we go look at our applet. So when you see this applet, up here we have our original population, our original values. And then down below, I can look at the means for different sample sizes. So I'll do a sample size of 2, and we'll do a sample size of 25. It's kind of our smallest and biggest that this applet lets us do. So if I find what it's going to look like for the means. Notice that when I start with a normal population, then even when I only have a sample size of two, what do my, all my possible sample means look like? They look like a normal distribution. And a sample size of 25, you can't tell because they have really weird, well, they don't have very many pixels. So, but that's still supposed to be the normal distribution. Okay, so the if you start with a normal distribution, it doesn't seem too surprising that your means will also follow a normal distribution. But let's try some different ones. Maybe something like this. So for my sample size of two, does that look like a normal distribution? Not yet, but does it look more like a normal distribution than my original one did? Yes, and by the time I get to sample size of 25, it looks like the normal distribution. Okay, what if we start with a nice flat one? By sample size of two, that's already, I mean, it's not quite normal, but it's now symmetric and it at least has a peak to it. And by 25, it looks like the normal distribution. Even I think the weirdest one I was a ever able to do looks something like this. Even with this really weird one, by a sample size of 2, it's starting to look more like the normal curve. And a sample size of 25, it looks like the normal curve, no problem. So it seems like no matter what we start with with our parent population, okay, and you can do anything you want, by the time you get to a sample size of 25, it's going to look like the normal distribution. Now let's look at some of those numbers. So it's going to be hard to see because it's just my cursor here. But you have your mean is 13.9 for my original population. Okay. Now look at the mean for, so this is the mean of all of the sample means. It's 13.9 and 13.91. So those are all the same. Now these aren't theoretical. These are like they did it 100,000 times. And so that's why it's not going to be exact, but pretty close. 
And so let's try a different one and see if that holds. So we have a mean of 20.66, mean of 20.66, mean 20.66. So the mean of all your possible sample means stays the same as your original mean. What about the standard deviation though? Here we have a standard deviation of 8.07 and then it's 5.69 and then it's 1.61. So what's happening to your standard deviation? It's getting smaller and it's getting smaller as my sample size gets bigger. And you can try anything you want. This is always going to hold. So my means stay the same, but my standard deviation gets smaller and smaller as my sample size gets bigger. So let's come back and write these answers in. So what does the sampling distribution of the sample mean look like? Okay. So it seems like it became normal. Okay. And it's normal either if the original population is normal or the sample size is large enough. And so then I wrote, doesn't matter what the original population looks like. So we tried several different ones and trying to make them weird and everything. So it didn't really matter. Eventually we got to the same results. So let's just word it slightly differently though. Maybe this way we'll sink in more. So we could say if the original population is normal. The sampling distribution of the mean, or let's say x bar, will be normal for any sample size. And for any original population, the sampling distribution looks normal if the sample size is large. So the less normal your original population is, the bigger sample size you need to make it end up looking normal. And what happened to our sampling distribution for x bar if we had a really weird shaped original population? Okay, again, it didn't matter how weird we made it. If the sample size is large enough, the sampling distribution will look normal. Let's see. And now, how did the mean or the average for all of those possible sample means compared to mu, which was the mean of our original population? Well, it was the same. So all of those means were always the same. So the mean for all of your possible sample means is always equal to mu or the mean of your original population. And how does the standard deviation of the population for all your possible sample means compare to sigma, which was your standard deviation of your original population? Well, it was smaller. And specifically, the
the standard deviation of all your possible means gets smaller as the sample size increases. The reason why, and we'll have this written on the next page too, is that it's actually equal to your original standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. So as n gets bigger, it must be getting smaller. Now for a little bit of rationale for why does it get smaller, okay, the reason why it actually gets smaller than your original population standard deviation is that your sample means are going to be less variable. So they're less spread out, there's less I guess kind of like chance of what you can get. The reason why is that your sample means average out your high and low sample measurements. So you take those, the biggest and smallest ones, and if you have them in a sample, they average out so you get something back in the middle. And what this means is that your sample mean can be expected to be fairly close to your population mean. In fact, it's going to be closer to your population mean than many of your individual people in the population would be. So you have all of those kind of short and tall people, they're kind of far away from the average, but any time you take a sample and you look at the average, that's going to be closer than a lot of just the individual people. And there's one more thing that we didn't actually look at, is does the sampling distribution of other statistics besides the mean, so like your median or your range or your standard deviation, do those still look normally distributed? So let's go back to our applet and look. So let's change, let's do this one as our median. We'll even do biggest sample size we can. Let's do a median for one. Let's do the range for one. And look. So you can see the median really doesn't look normal. The range, it's kind of hard to tell because again we just don't have enough pixels. But it is less skewed and doesn't necessarily look normal. Let's try another one. This one, the median is kind of starting to look normal, but the range you can see is definitely less skewed and not normal. You could try like the standard deviation. It doesn't look too bad there. And again, not too bad. But that's just kind of more coincidence. It doesn't have to end up looking normal, and the range doesn't look normal. So do these others have to be normally distributed? Not necessarily. Sometimes they might just kind of be, by coincidence, look almost normal. But there's nothing that says they have to be. That's just coincidence. But it does work every single time for the sample mean, which is pretty cool. Now for your notes, I just have three different populations that I did. Okay, so three three different populations. Here are the different sampling distributions for size 2, 5, 10, and 30. Just so we can look at this. So you can see that for our first one that started out normal, all of the sampling distributions were normal for any sample size. But for population 2, that was definitely not normal. We have to get to probably like a 10 or 30 sample size by the time it starts looking normal. And for population 3, it doesn't start looking very good until about 30. I guess 10 is not too bad. But it just turns out the more normal you are, the smaller your sample size can be and you'll still look normal. But no matter what, by the time you get to about 30, your sample means will always look normal. And so again, just a few notes here to summarize. The mean of all of your possible sample means is the same as the mean of your original population. So the mean for x bar is equal to your original mean for your population. The standard deviation of all your possible sample means gets smaller and smaller <coughs> as your sample size increases. The formula for that is sigma for x bar is equal to sigma over the square root of n. And what is the shape of the sampling distribution for the sample means if we start with a normal population? <coughs> It is normal for any sample size.
And what is the shape of the sampling distribution for the sample means if we start with a non-normal population? So even if you start off with something weird, the shape becomes more normal as the sample size increases. So this is, if you were to read your textbook, this is their official little blurb that they would give you about the sampling distribution of X bar. So let's assume our original population has a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, and we can randomly select a sample of size n. Then our population for all the possible sample means okay, will have a normal distribution. Now we say that, but it's an exactly normal distribution if the original population was normally distributed for any sample size. It's going to be an approximate normal distribution for any population if your sample size is large enough. Now large enough for us means the n is at least 30. That's kind of our good rule of thumb. The, it will have a mean equal to mu and the standard deviation will be sigma over square root of n. The central limit theorem basically just says the same thing as part one, but it's famous enough that we write it out which again it tells you that if your sample size is large enough, your population for all your possible sample means is approximately normally distributed for any population. So it's the most famous theorem we have in statistics. And as the sample size n increases, the normal curve becomes a better approximation for your sampling distribution of x bar. We can use it if we have at least n is 30. So now that we have all of that, if we want to use our normal distribution to find probabilities for the sample mean, we use the standardization formula. So remember before we had just x minus mu over sigma, well now if you're dealing with x bar you want to do an x bar minus mu for x bar over sigma of x bar. Now you can write out this formula every time or you can actually go ahead and simplify things that you know. So like you know that the mean of x bar is always going to be mu. And you know that sigma for x bar is always going to be sigma or square root of n. So whichever formula, you're welcome to use whichever one. Sometimes it depends on if I have intermediate steps where I have to find these first. And keep in mind, this is important, you can only use the normal distribution to find probabilities if your original population is normally distributed or your sample size is large enough. And when we say large enough, we mean that n is at least 30 or something really close. So in this example, the number of gypsy moths caught in a trap is discrete and very skewed. The population mean number of moths caught is 0.5. Now when it says the population mean, I'm going to hurry and write down, then that's population mean is 50, oh not 50, 0.5. And the standard deviation is 0.7. So those were for the original population. And then it says Paul checks 60 traps. So my sample size is 60. Now, what is the distribution of x bar going to be? And after we answer that, what's the probability that the mean number of moths in the traps is greater than 0.68? So first, let's answer the question for distribution. Now when we say distribution, we want th three things usually. The shape, well, n is 60, that's bringing the 30, so our shape will be normal. We want our mean, so the mean for x bar is equal to your original population of mu, which is 0.5. And sigma for x bar is equal to your original standard deviation over square root of n. So 0.7 over the square root of 60, which is 0.0904. Oh so that's what they ask, they're asking for when they say what's the distribution the shape, the mean, the standard deviation. Now the other thing I asked for is what's the probability that our mean, our sample mean of moss is greater than 0.68? So what's the probability that x bar is greater than 0.68? So remember when we ask a question like this, this is saying before we take our sample we don't know what sample mean we're going to get. <coughs> so now what's the probability that we get a sample mean that's bigger than 0.68? So that's what we're looking for. The first thing we'll always do is we come over here and standardize. Okay. 
So to standardize, we need to do x bar minus mu of x bar over sigma of x bar. Now I already calculated those, so I'll just go ahead and plug everything in. The x bar we're interested in is 0 0.68. The mean is 0 0.5. And the standard deviation is 0 0.0904 which is 1.99. So instead of finding the probability that x bar is bigger than 0.68, we find the probability that z is greater than 1.99. So we draw a picture. Here's my 1.99, and we need to open up the normal table. So for 1.99, here's my 1.9 over here. 0.9767, but that's going to be the area to the left. So 0.9767, so to the right, will be 1 minus that, which is 0 0.0233. So coming back up here, let's write this out. This is going to be 1 minus our 0.9767, which gives me 0 0.0233. So there is a 2.33% chance that Paul will pick a sample that has a sample average of 0.68 or greater. So again, these probabilities are found before we actually look at the sample. So hopefully as we did this problem, I know that we had something slightly new and that we have to find mu and sigma for x bar. But other than that, it should seem like a very similar pro process when we found the probabilities for the normal distribution. You standardize and find z. You draw a picture. You look it up on the table. That's really all there is. So for my next example, the scores of all the high school students. Okay, now that all tells you this is going to be our population. Let's see, all the students in the nation were roughly normally distributed. So I can say that it's normal to start with. We had a mean for my original population is 19.2 and the standard deviation is 5.1. So number one says, what is the probability that a randomly chosen student scores at least 21 on the exam? Now notice this is just one randomly chosen student, so this is just one individual student. This is not a sample. They didn't say take a sample, find the average, et cetera. They just said one student. So this goes back to what we did in chapter five. It's not new. So we're looking for the probability that one student, so just an X, is at least 21. So when you come over here and try and standardize that, when you standardize for one value, you just do X minus mu over sigma. So we'll do 21 minus 19.2 over 5.1, which is 0.35. So the probability that x is at least 21, we can change the probability that z is at least 0.35. So here's my 0.35, and I'm looking for the area to the right. So back to my normal table. We want 0.35, looks like it's 0.6368, but of course that's the area to the left. So the area to the right is 1 minus that, or 0.3632. So we'll do 1 minus our 0 0.6368, gives me 0 0.3632. So about a 36% chance that one student, if you just pick any one student, they'll have scored at least the 21.
And you'll find on the homework and exa exam reviews, or maybe even on the exam, that it's often like this. I'll ask you one question about like a one individual student, and then I'll ask you another question about sample means. So now in part two, we decide to take a sample of 25 randomly chosen students and find their sample mean. What is the distribution of x bar? So again, when we say distribution, we mean three things. What is the shape? <coughs> now, they said our original population was normal, so it doesn't even matter what our sample size is. No? Although 25 is so close to 30 that I probably would have still said it would be normal. So let's say normal because our original population was normal. And we want to know our mean. So the mean is always equal to the mean of your original population, so 19.2. And the shape is, it's not shape, sorry, standard deviation is your original standard deviation divided by square root of n. So in this case, 5.1 over the square root of, what do we say our sample size is? n equals 25. So square root of 25 gives me 1.02. Now that we've found that, I might ask you something like, what's the probability that a sample of 25 randomly chosen students has a sample mean of at least 21? So now we're looking for the probability that x bar is at least 21. So very similar to what we did up above, but now we need to standardize and we'll use a slightly different formula. Because for z, instead of x, you have to do an x bar and then you'll want to minus the average of x bar and the standard deviation of x bar. So just make sure you're using the right one for sample means. So in our case, we're interested in a 21. We know our mean is 19.2. So I'm just looking at what we found up above. And the new standard deviation for the sample means is 1.02. So this is 1.76. So now we're looking for the probability that z is at least 1.76. So here's my 1.76. If I look this up on my table, the area to the left is 0.9. 608, so that means area to the right is 0.0392. So I'm going to do a 1 minus 0.9608, which gives me 0.0392. So notice, this almost seemed the same. In number 1, we said what's the probability that like one individually randomly chosen person will score at least a 21? Now, at least a 21 means that it's kind of a high score. Okay. So they had about a 36% chance. But what was the probability of my sample mean being bigger than 21? It was only about 4%. Because once you take your sample means, you're supposed to be close to your average of 19.2. So the probability of being bigger than 21 is very small. One different thing we might want to try and do is I might ask you how big of a sample would you need if you want to ensure that the standard deviation for your sample means is less than 0.5. Well, you know that your formula is just sigma over square root of n. Or in our case, we know that sigma is 5.1, so 5.1 over square root of n. So if we want this to be less than 0.5, We'll set 5.1 over square root of n less than 0.5 and solve for n. Let's see. So I'll multiply both sides by the square root of n. So 5.1 is less than 0.5 square root of n. I can divide both sides by 0.5. So 10.2 point two is less than square root of n. I can square both sides and I get a hundred no, I get one oh four point oh four 
is less than n. So that means n has to be at least 105. So you always round up. So if you want to ensure that you have a small enough standard deviation, we want to look at 105 students at least. Now this is because you kind of know in advance you want to have a high level of accuracy. Your standard deviation tells you how high of your accuracy will be basically. Because the smaller your standard deviation, the closer your sample mean is going to be to your population mean. Which will become important in our next section, next chapter that we do. Now we're supposed to do this next problem, but I think we'll actually skip it because it's just kind of harder. It's the way that the textbook manipulates things, which is okay, but we'll just skip it and I'll take out any like that on your homework. And we're going to talk just a little bit more about sampling distributions and some different ones. So we talked about the sampling distribution for the sample mean. You could also have the sampling distribution for your sample variance. This one we're not really going to use too much in this class, but just so you've seen it, if you take your sample variance times it by your sample size minus one and divide by the population variance, you get a chi-square distribution, which probably won't mean too much to you, but maybe you'll use it some other time, and at least it won't be the first time you've seen it then. This one, though, we do care about. We're going to use this one a lot. What's your sampling distribution of X bar if you don't know the population variance? So like we learned that we could estimate the population mean mu with our sample mean x bar and the standard deviation of x bar is just sigma over square root of n. But that sigma is for your original population. And if you need to estimate the population mean mu, you probably don't actually know the population standard deviation either. Like why would you know that but not know the population mean? It's not impossible but it's not very likely. So instead of using sigma in our calculations, we have to estimate sigma with our sample standard deviation, s. But as soon as we do that, we're going to switch from using our standard normal distribution to using the t distribution. So we did talk about the t distribution a little bit back in section 5.4, but we really haven't done anything with it. So it won't seem familiar yet, but we will kind of look it up in this class and learn how to use it in the next chapter. So in this example, if or for example, if you have your observations x1 up to xn, if they're a sample from a normal population with a mean mu and an unknown population variance, so we don't actually know what sigma is, if we standardize our sample mean by doing x bar minus mu and then we do s for our sample standard deviation over square root of n, it will have a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So let's just make ourselves a note, s equals our sample standard deviation. So again, we'll estimate our population mean mu with our sample mean x bar, and it's what we call our standard error of our estimate. Standard error is s over square root of n. So instead of sigma over square root of n, we'll do an s, and we call it standard error when we use s instead of sigma. So when you don't know your population standard you have to estimate with s, and so we just call it standard error. Now let's suppose that we wanted to estimate the mean height of student in this class, and we were going to draw a sample of x1 up to x6, so that means six students in this class to look at their height. So we said n equals 6. Now I'm going to use our data from when I did this in a previous class just to save time. Since it takes so long for you guys to talk with the microphones. So let's say that n is 6. Okay, so what is our population? Do we know the population mean or variance? So our population would be all 29 students in this class. And because I haven't asked you all of your heights, we don't know the mean or variance. The mean or standard deviation. 
So for an actual data, last time we did this, I just had six people call out their heights, but let's just write them down. So in inches, they were 76, 78, 66, 72, 69, and 65. I think there, there was more guys that volunteered. So with that data, what would be our estimate for the population mean height? Well, our estimate would be find the sample mean. So we'd add all of those numbers together. And divide by how many there are. So we get 71. So this is our estimate of our population mean height. And what would be our standard error of our estimate? Let's see. So standard error for x bar, basically it's the standard deviation of x bar, but we're using our sample data instead. So s over squared of n. We don't know what s is. I'll use my calculator to find this. To find the sample standard deviation S is 5.29. So we have 5.29 over the square root of our sample size, which was 6. So we get 2.1596. So my final question asks, how much is our estimate likely to be off by? So I don't know if you remember in section 7.1, we said that your standard error tells you how close your estimate is likely to be to the true value. So our estimate of 71 inches is likely within about 2.1596 inches of the true average. So again, your standard error tells you how close you're likely to be. Now, I can still be further than that. These are just percentages. It's only about like a 68% chance that I'm within that 2.15. But So we're likely to be within about 2 inches. So how would I say, well, I don't want to be within 2 inches. What if I want to be within like 0.5 inches? What would you do? You just increase your sample size. Because if you increase your sample size, this standard error will get smaller, and you're likely to be even closer to your true value.